Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. It seems that I've picked up quite a lot of subs since the last one went out, so thank you so much for the support. My name is Scott and I own Golden Era Aged Guitars. In this video, I'm going to talk for about half an hour about the necks that I use and the processes that they go through uh, with respect to the maple and the rosewood. So let's hop over to the bench cam and go from there. So here we are guys, back at the bench and a golden opportunity arose the other day when I actually realized I've got some necks here in various stages of completion. And this one's actually, this rosewood one, I actually sold on the website a few weeks ago and is going out with a body that I did a commission order from last year. So that's all going out together. But the purpose of this video isn't really, it's not, there's no how to's, it's not a tutorial, it's not me giving away absolutely everything I do because for me, some of the magic would be lost. But I also like to keep some of the processes that I've worked on to myself because they're my processes and they work for me and it's something that I kind of live by every day. So this video is more about showing you how we get from the unfinished state that these ones are in to these ones by just going through the step, like a step, well not step by step, but just to talk about them in general, I suppose. But the first thing that's ridiculously important is being able to get these necks and being able to get a continuity of stock, being able to bring them in at a reasonable price and sell them at a price that includes everything. So the, the fretwork's done, uh, the tuners are installed, uh, even going as far as having the screw holes drilled in the heel of the neck. Massive, it's little things that just all really add up. So <clears throat> the first thing that happens with these necks is once I've got them in from whatever supplier that does all parts, and sometimes I get them just from all parts directly, these go straight off to Ernie McMillan. Now, Ernie is a master luthier, uh, has been for a couple of decades now, an extraordinarily knowledgeable man, luthier. It absolutely astounds me the level of his ability and knowledge. And these necks all go off to Ernie, who is ex Loudon Acoustics and ex Avalon Acoustics. And he does all of these bone nuts. He also levels the frets. Now, for me, being able to offer these out to you guys with a, I mean, these aren't, you know, pre-cut, pre-slotted, pre-radiused bone nuts. These are cut from blanks. So, I mean, that's something I, I've tried to do. <laughs> I've tried to do the pre-slotted ones with the pre-radius, um, base in them it I, I, it just doesn't work i i can't do it uh, that's a job for somebody who knows what they're doing who can do it blindfolded uh, ernie does an amazing job every single one of these necks has been absolutely perfect the frets are all leveled as well and it's something that you know for me to send a neck out and say guess what you're getting a bone nut and level frets it's so cool i mean that's just absolutely awesome so Poor Ernie gets quite a lot of work from me, as you can imagine, with the amount of necks that I do. And once I bring them back in, that's kind of where I take over and the rest of it is quite purely and simply golden era. Now, the first thing that has to happen is the fret ends get beveled and the fingerboard edges get rolled. Now, I've got one here actually that if I, I start to leave masking tape notes on everything. You can actually see the difference. This is one, this is actually quite an interesting detail, but you can, you can kind of tell straight away. You can hear there's like a rough edge on that. I don't know what it sounds like on camera, but that's got a rough, unfinished, very s squared edge on it. Machined would be a good word. You can see, you can actually see, I, well, I can see from the camera. That's a lot different 
you can see just looking down how everything kind of just rolls over. That's just when you put it in your hand, you know straight away when you're, you know, you're moving up and down. You can't feel anything. There's no like sticky bits, there's no metal jagging out or anything. Whereas in their raw state, you can hear that, you know, it's quite, it's like a, well, what's the, it's like cheese grater, isn't it? That's the, the common term used. So we want to get rid of all that. You just, you want to lose all that. Now it's easier with the rosewood than it is on the maple, because obviously the maple is a much harder wood. So once all that's done, I mean, that can take quite a long time. That's that's not a quick process. That that does take, especially, you know, when I've got the bench cleared, there might be 10 of these necks on the bench. That's a big job. You know, it's a big job. Um, Definitely one where your hands get sore, your fingers get sore. So <clears throat> if I do 10, I've done extraordinarily well, but five would be, be, would be more realistic. Five kind of keeps my attention where it should be fo fully focused. I think once you start going outside that, it starts to waver a wee bit. So it, 10, I'll do 10 if I've you know, had a good, a good day, if I just can keep going with it, if I think I'm up to it. But if I think at any point that my attention starts to go, then I will stop because it's something, the necks are, the necks are really dear to me. You know, the bodies are, the bodies are kind of what everybody loves to look at on Instagram. But uh, this is it's difficult for me to put this into words to write on an Instagram post. But for me to be able to pick that neck up and just go, <laughs> wow, you know, to take it from how that feels to how this feels and to how it looks, it's I just absolutely love that. And this is this is what you play. You know, you play the neck. You have to make that connection. So it's got to feel good. And it all starts with that. I guess you could call it slinky and smooth feeling that you would get from not getting st not getting stabbed by frets. So um, we want to get rid of all that. <clears throat> Next on the agenda with the necks is we want to get rid of machine lines, which is kind of a continuation of what I was saying about the the fretboard edges. The machine line thing, uh, some. <sighs> I've had a few commissions through where somebody wants to do like a late sixties sort of vibe and they say like don't you know, don't worry about doing this next step. But for me, i d I'm not trying to uh, I think that's a, a maybe a, a misconception with what I do. I'm trying to make everything look a certain era as such, like a like an early fifties sort of thing or you know, sixties. I am doing these little details that I've kind of married together from various points in time in it's Fender's history, isn't it, really? Uh, one thing that I absolutely love is the rounded over all these machine edges. We get rid of all these machine edges because these are really harsh. They're really harsh. Now, at some point, <clears throat> at some point in Fender's history, they started to just leave this alone. They didn't spend the time shaping. They would contour all this in. They would roll this entire line straight down next so it looked like one big continuous curve. There was no V where the headstock joined the back of the, the shaft. Now, I'm not really too bothered about being period correct on this. I just want the next to look cool and feel good. So as you can see, this is where the strip light above my head actually works for me. You can see there's no V. It's all curved, right? It's all flared right out. And that's really, really nice when you get up to this point and you're not feeling a V. It's just smooth. So that's something that I do on all of the Jazzmaster, Jaguar, strat necks just all of them you don't need to do it so much on the telly necks because of the shape of the headstock it kind of loans itself to not needing that done but there is still a little bit of sanding done so that is a big thing just to get rid of all of those harsh machine edges you can see it again on the front you can just see this little highlight that's running along i mean that's the light bouncing off a, the curved edge now i'll do that on 
but you can see it there. I do it on all the machine edges. I just want to get, I want to get rid, <clears throat> I want to get rid of all of the harsh bits. Just make it nice and smooth. It's really a case of, we live in a world of CNC, a world of that has to be perfect. It has to be millimeter correct. Why doesn't that fit in there? Why doesn't that work? Blah, blah, blah. I like to put that kind of hand finished element back in, which funnily enough involves quite a lot of labor. <laughs> it's quite intensive removing all of these harsh edges. But again, do a nice little batch of five necks and it's no problem at all. It's so enjoyable to watch them go from this into this. So once that's done, the next part is we get the um, we get the fretboards masked off. Well, actually, another thing that I would do is <clears throat> the dots on the side are removed and replaced. These dots here that I have in are not actually the ones in this neck are not these ones discolored. These these dots are all eventually removed, but before spraying, these ones have to be removed. So that's another job that gets done. But once that's done, and I make sure that I have a couple of bodies that I actually take the necks and slot them into, what I've actually discovered is these necks are actually starting to get a little bit fatter in the heel, which is kind of leaning towards a Japanese spec a little bit more. So I like to have a couple of bodies here and I just like to slot the, I like to slot the necks into the body just to make sure that we're, you know, we're good so that when I send the necks out to you, we're, we've got a fighting chance that these things are going to slot right in. Now, it's wood. Uh, <laughs> it's wood and, you know, you've got a body from another another company and you've got one of these necks, you might have to do a bit of nipping and tucking, but that's just true of, you know, bolt on guitars. And it happens with set necks when they're building set necks too. You can have everything CNC'd. When you slot the two bits together, they need a bit of fine fettling. So that's kind of where the, that that side of things comes in. I like just to have a couple of strap bodies here and I'll, I'll put the necks in to see what kind of fit we're getting. The good thing about that is I know how much to leave for my finish. So if you've got that reasonably tight fit, if you've got the kind of fit where you put the neck in and you're able to lift the body and the neck up at the same time, uh, like a paddle, you know, with no, no screws in it, just lifts the whole thing up. You're, for paint, you're probably a little bit too tight. So you need to take a little bit more off, just, just, a, just a tiny, tiny fraction off the heel <clears throat> before you put the actual finish on. But once all that's done, once the bone nut's done, the frets are done, it's all beveled in, uh, all the machine lines are taken out. Then the, the, I would say the more artistic side of it starts to kick in now. This is where I get to add the tint, all the various tints. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to move these out, these two unfinished ones out the way. And I'm just going to bring, I'm going to bring these other ones into view just so you can see what's going on. <clears throat> so we've got, got four necks. Now, I don't know what it looks like on camera. This one is actually the most heavily tinted and aged and I would say this one's possibly the lightest not in terms of wear but just in terms of tint now this one was done deliberately it's not finished and um, there's still quite a lot to do on this one but the actual fingerboard this section here is as good as done as I, I think I'm, I'm going to get it so this one's actually for a friend of mine Gareth Bruff and Gareth if you know, if you follow me on Instagram, you'll have seen Gareth's work. I've pinched a few of his pictures. Gareth does my design work for the 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 branding uh, on all the for sale images that you see on a Friday. So this, if you follow any of Gareth's work, you'll know that he is a fan of this this type of thing. He likes more interesting things. He is a massive photography buff as well. Um, so he, I'm always tapping him for advice and asking for help. He likes being able to photograph something like this, which I totally understand because it does make for a fascinating photograph. So 
the idea was that you start off with a certain tint and then you can layer it up. You can you just start to stack the tint up and you get to a point where it's reasonably saturated and you get to this kind of colour. So it might start like this, but then you work your way up until you get to something like this. And at that point, you're kind of building an idea of what you're going to do at the end in your head. So with this one, I knew it was going to be, I guess you could call it fairly nicotined. It was fairly, fairly uh, worn in. And this was the type of vibe I wanted for this one. Whereas one like this might be more like a cowboy chord sort of neck where all the wear is down towards uh, the first, you know, first five frets or so. And both of these tints, you can you can start to layer up some of the other little details on it whenever I, I mean, whenever I bring them back and put them on the bench, it's when the fun really starts. But I don't know if you can see, but there's actually, I mean, that's really heavily discolored. This particular one isn't totally finished, but there's a lot of discoloration. And you'd see it on the old black guard necks. It's all very... <clears throat> It's all very, again, nicotined, I think's a good word. It just all looks smoke stained. That's something you can actually, it's a trend that you can actually continue you know, throughout the whole neck because that's, that's just how those things look. They're just old necks. The lacquer has picked up decades of dirt, smoke, grime, sweat, all, just everything. Just picked up so much stuff. Um, and it's good fun. You know, it's good fun being able to kind of build that story up and just put a bit of life back into, well, I suppose you're putting, not putting life back into anything. These are brand new necks. So you're kind of, you're trying to create a, a possible story or scenario that this neck might have been used for. But something, you'll see it on, on, on all the maple necks that are here. I am a big fan of these dirty spots on every fret. So it looks like there's been strings on it. Um, so you see lots of lines coming this way and then you'll see the wear marks actually match up to those lines. So it's, it's little details like that. It's just allowing you to build up that picture of this neck could have been on a guitar for 60 years and it's been heavily played. It's been in smoky bars for most of that time. And here you are, this is, this is just the way they go. I get asked to do a lot of this type of thing. Very few people will say, Scott, can you do me a, a, a fairly clean maple neck? I just don't get asked for that. So this is all a result now of me being able to have some real fun. Uh, customers allowing me to kind of flex my create, creative side as much as possible. But yeah, I mean, I get them back on the, I get them back on the bench. The annoying thing is when I get them back on the bench, the rosewood still looks like this. Now, this is the one thing I always get asked, uh, and I've no doubt I'll be asked several times uh, after this video comes out, as probably as a joke, because I've said I'm not going to say. I'm not going to say what my process is. This is something that's very close to me. It's not a secret, but it's my process. And it's one of those things that I think I'm allowed to have where I... I can share as much as possible, but when it comes to this, I just want to keep this for me and for anybody who wants to actually buy one of the necks. What I will say is this is not dye, so this will not come off on your fingers. You won't end up with lighter brown patches or anything. This is now the color of this wood. That's how it's going to stay. Now, the one thing that I usually do before the necks go out, and this one is due, I would say that that neck hasn't had any lemon oil for a couple of weeks, uh, probably since it was photographed for the website, because I'm, I'm still working on the body. But <clears throat> these usually get soaked in lemon oil. When that's all done, I wipe off the excess. This is a free plug for Monty's uh, pickups. They do this fabulous instrument food. Now I must admit, they sent me a mug. The mug was level completely to the brim. So there's a there's quite a uh, quite a scoop out of that. I've had this for I was gonna say three years, maybe more, which is absolutely crazy. Because the amount of necks I do, and I've only taken you know that much out of it. So it's absolutely phenomenal. But that's the last thing that I put on the rosewood 
after the lemon oil has gone on. So this just keeps the board nourished. Rich and nourished is what I would say. Absolutely invaluable. Uh, go and buy a tin. It's absolutely brilliant. You're also very handy for, I think you can just use it on wood in general. You know, if you have to wax uh, like an old tabletop or something, I'm pretty sure they said you can use it for that. This is also extremely handy. You'll hear a lot of uh, luthiers and techs talk about uh, keeping soap, a bar of soap or some sort of lubricant for screws, putting together guitars. <clears throat> this stuff's absolutely amazing. Just dip, a dip your finger in, rub it around the screw and then put the screw into the, the hole. Uh, absolutely fantastic. Uh, it does, the, the, uh, assuming you've got the right bit in your screwdriver, <clears throat> the screw won't slip. You just go nicely into it. So it's just, it's a good lubricant for all sorts of things to do with wood and guitars and stuff. So <clears throat> now once I've got the majority of this wear done, this takes a long time to do. I, I'm, uh, you probably would guess that this isn't a five minute job. Once that's done, I like to move on to the headstock. So I just take everything in stages. I don't I don't really try and look at it and think, well, what am I going to do with this neck? You know, from the very start, it goes in processes. It is stages to this and you're building and you're building and you're building. So we get up to the point where we can all look at these things and go, right, now what? What's the next step? These are quite good because they're all in different stages. Uh, this one... I say it's finished, but it's not as, I mean, it's obviously because it's rosewood, but the headstock isn't as discolored as the likes of this one, but it's still got, um, there's still wear on it and they're still checking, which you should be able to see in the light, which is pretty cool. Not much, just, just enough. A little bit of a cheeky silhouette from what might have been a decal at some point. Wink, wink. If if the owner chooses to put a decal on, that's up to that's up to them. Uh, but we're allowed to make these insinuate that there might have been something there at some point, just very subtly. So little details like that I like to throw in randomly. Uh the next stage after after fingerboards have been taken care of is usually going into headstock aging. Uh I don't think it's gonna show up particularly well. This has got a real smoked out sort of look. Because I'm right under a light, it's actually making it look a bit lighter than it actually is. But this has got quite a lot of detail on it, which there you go. I think you can kind of see that's quite true there. So you can see staining, random staining. And again, just true of old maple. It just it does its it does it does its own thing. It just picks up. The lacquer on the maple just picks up all these marks over the years. And something that I really like, I and I did it on a neck that I sent out last week. I'm so annoyed I did that. I wish I'd asked the customer if I could keep it back for a week. Uh, I saw a good, I saw a couple of vintage guitars. I think they were in uh, they were in some neck guitars in Dublin. And along the top here, it had the most f fascinating discoloration. It was, it was really orange, um, ambered sort of staining along the top. And you're looking at me, you're thinking, how does that happen? And then you realize just somebody's finger rubbing, somebody's finger rubbing across the top of that for decades has caused this random discoloration. Well, that's random. It's not really random, is it? It's, it's definitely there for a reason, but that's why that's happened. And you don't think about all these things when you're looking at guitars. It's kind of like reverse engineering. You, you, you know, you're seeing this end result, and you've got to figure out, well, what? How the hell did that? How did that happen? So that's part of the fun. You know, I really like it, but um, this one doesn't really have that. The one I sent out last week definitely did. While I've got this in my hand, something I really like doing is tuners. Now, I use Godo SD nine ones on everything. They're absolutely fantastic. Uh, nickel. Uh, I don't even know if they do chrome, but I, I love the nickel. Um, these come in bone stock, nice and shiny nickel. And this is how I like to finish them. So as you can see, there's like pitting details. Uh, it's all over. It's not just on 
select parts. But because of the randomness of aging metal, this particular, this way I like to do it, when you tie details like this into details like this, and then you obviously get staining on the front and the finger border, it just adds something to the entire look. It's so cool. And I just love building this story in this picture. But the tuners is something, I, I love doing them myself. And I, it's so easy to take the lazy way out and buy the pre-aged ones or the, the relic ones that they call them. I've actually got one here. You see the difference. <clears throat> so this is, now there's nothing wrong with these. Uh, I mean, Goto must sell hundreds of these a day. I, there's nothing wrong with them at all. But these these are, I don't know if you can see that properly, but these are actually, it's almost like a flat, blanketed, sort of matte satin aged look. I think you get that from, if I'm right in saying it's the, the fume method, the acid fume method. You leave them in a box which sits in a bath of whatever acid it is, and it eventually turns the nickel this cut this this it turns it this finish basically. But that's good for them because that gives them continuity of stock. So they can sell the same product over and over and over again, no quibbles. That's not me. I don't want to do that. So part of the bargain that you guys get is I just love all this randomness. Just and you can see it quite clearly whenever you tilt it to the light. So everything has got that little bit of individuality going on. And that's just, again, one of those things when you add it all up, it makes all the difference. So, but yeah, every single tuner, every single screw and every single bushing, they all get done individually. So I must be completely mad. But then you can also see why this stuff takes me so long to do. Now there's one other thing that, <laughs> I didn't used to do this. This was years ago, and I do mean years ago. I didn't used to do this. And I, I was trying to offer you guys the best deal at the end of this. You open the box, and you get your neck out. You put everything on the table, and you go, oh, that's so cool. Look at that. You stick it into the body. You do your mock-up on your kitchen table, and you think, this is going to be a killer guitar. Amazing. Take the neck out and you have another good look around it and oh man, nobody's drilled the screw holes. Well, all the necks that go out have got screw holes drilled just to make sure that they are all done properly. This one's had two of them done. I do actually use a neck screw. I actually do a mock-up with every single neck so this neck will end up in a body with a neck plate and four screw holes in it these are all um waxed before they go in as well using monty's instrument food so that just means that when this goes in to the screw holes that means that the inside of the screw hole has already got a little bit of the wax left in it so that means that when hopefully you go to put your screws in and attach this to the body it should be relatively straightforward, but I would always say use a little bit of the of, of wax of some description just to help out. So when you bring all that together, you have something that has gone from this to this. And I think more amazingly is, yeah, the rosewood looks cool. And it's arguably it's my I I I, I love the feel of uh, rosewood under the finger. I don't know why I um I'm still learning to love maple, but for working on maple, I absolutely love it. To be able to take this with the help of the expert that is Ernie McMillan doing his part at, at the very beginning of the process, to then turning it into something that looks like this. I don't know. Uh, I don't want. It sounds. It sounds obviously um, narcissistic, but just to be able to do that and actually look at at the end of it and say, "Wow, 
I'm happy with that. That's absolutely killer. You you know, there's only so many times you can blow your own trumpet during all this, but I think just if you get to the end of this and stand back and go, yeah, that's that's proper cool. And when you do a mock up with a body, just to have that little buzz, that little excitement going on. If you're excited about what you do, if you're if you're if you love what you do, if the passion's there, if you don't mind putting the extra effort in to making it the best it can be, then it makes what you're buying so much better. And I absolutely love doing necks. So they do take a long time to do, but ultimately I think they're absolutely worth the wait. It's easy for me to say that because I'm not a customer who's waiting patiently on a on a neck that's taking months to do. But these things do take a while. Uh, just to kind of highlight something that isn't a five minute job, that then this is where the lacquer needs to be at a certain point because a lot of this is literally paint drying, the wait time, this lead time. Things like this, you can actually see these lines going this way up here. That's all checking. That's not, you can see it in the light. That's actual checking. Now to get lacquer to do that, it has to be at a certain point. Okay, that's not gonna happen in a week. That That's gonna take a little bit of time. So you can see the checking running this way as well. For me, allowing this product, this lacquer to do what it does to know how to, uh, I wouldn't say manipulate it, but certainly how to coax it in certain ways and knowing when to apply certain processes. I think that's absolutely crucial. So again, I'm happy with, I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely ecstatic with how these are looking. I'm so happy. I've able, been able just to get three of these on the bench at the same time. It makes me very happy to see this. So what I'll probably do is, before these go out, do some proper photos with them and I'll be able to stick them up on Instagram. There will be an neck page added to the website. Uh, we're in the third week of uh, March 2024, just for a date reference on this. I am aiming to have a neck page up on the website within, uh, I don't know, within the next three or four weeks. So please be sure to have a look at that. But I've waffled on enough about necks. I probably could talk longer. Uh, I think if we had, um, between us, I think if we had more time, uh, if I was able to go into a bit more detail on some stuff without giving stuff away, I'd love to do that. I just don't think it's gonna be possible. So I think I've probably told you enough that I'm happy with you knowing. I also think that given you know, given what products are available out there, um, I think transparency is a massive thing, building that trust with you guys that you know that I'm using, as I say, I'm using all parts next to do what I do. Uh, I'm also trying to remain as true as possible to what I do with my processes, but I'm also wanting to kind of bring you guys in a little bit just to let you see how they how they start, how they end up, these are just examples. Um, you might not be a massive fan of the heavy finger wear. We, we all totally get that. Not everybody likes everything the same. And part of, I suppose, my learning process is now I have to be able to dial this back a little bit, which is actually going to be one of the hardest things is showing restraint. And that's one of the hardest things about uh, in the aging world. That's a very difficult thing to do, but it's a challenge I'm willing to accept. So guys, Thanks so much for hanging around. This one's been a bit longer than I, I thought it would be. Uh, again, I could probably talk at length, even more so than I already have. But uh, for now, thank you very much for watching and I will catch up with you in the next one.